And hello from Sydney. Welcome to the Proof of Concept podcast, the tech show where we explore real life use cases from the field and discuss some hot questions in the field of data science and AI. I am your host here, Grant Case, and today we are joined by Rishu Sixana. So I have known Rishu for almost two years now. Uh, Rishu come, uh, is currently at Snowflake, where he works in the CTO office, uh, working with organizations uh, and their use of data science and AI in the cloud. Uh, today's topic is really about uh, why is it great to be a data scientist in the cloud? But before we start, Rishu, welcome to the Proof of Concept podcast. Jan, thank you so much for the introduction. Hey, by the way, I think it's more than two years. It's more than two years. <laughs> um, yeah, we met when you came first uh, to Sydney, I think back in 2019. Yeah, so uh, a little further than that. So imagine when the pandemic comes through, you know, time has no meaning anymore. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> Yeah. So today is, I was saying that today's topic is really why it's a great time to be a data scientist in the cloud, but that also kind of starts with uh, the proof of concept podcast. I'll, I'll deviate a little bit. Why is it not a great time to be a data scientist, not in the cloud? Yeah, look, I think uh, it's, 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 it's a very good question. To be honest, data scientists today, uh, and I, and I speak to a few organizations, um, they are not, so the few good things have happened in last, I would say 20 odd years. Uh, as you know, data scientists, they use libraries and they love processing large volumes of data. Um, and we have had technologies from last almost 15, 20 years that are more accessible to data scientists to actually benefit from the fact that they can get access to the compute and that they can use this data. Because if you look at the libraries, like, Things like um, you know um, PyTorch, uh, which is built on top of you know our existing libraries, like they, all these were built you know ages ago. Then nothing yeah. that ha that new has happened in the last fifteen years. Mm -hmm. What has changed is the fact that you can now start using these libraries at scale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I, I remember the first uh, driverless autonomous car was back in early nineteen nineties. It is nothing new that we have done in the last 10 years. Like Tesla has not just suddenly came out of the box and suddenly invented something new. Uh, well, you would, I don't know if Elon Musk would agree with you on that one, but yes. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Uh, but all I'm saying here is that uh, the fact that it is more um, commercialized is because there's all this compute and storage that is yeah. available abundantly in cloud. Now on the flip side, the question was, if you're not in cloud, you're still living in an era where you're restricted by how much data you can access, how much compute do you have access to. Uh, and for that matter, like the data itself that is required to do any kind of machine learning, um, you are again constrained by the fact that that data is not come, coming in the data platform that you're using for data science workload. And they're all going into, um, they're ETLing into a data platform that, you know, they're business users, analysts, BI reports take priority over data science. Mm -hmm. And it's a sad reality, right? And then data scientists are asked to take a copy of this data into another fixed environment. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a standard problem that I'm glad that more organizations are actually, actually coming out of this problem. They're not, they're, they're not constrained, but they're still quite a lot. That and I think that's, you know, you've kind of hit at the ground uh, running for us out in the Proof of Concept podcast. It's like, what is so cool about this particular technology? You know, you really kind of hit it on the head. Uh, I always, when people ask, well, all this machine learning stuff seems to be brand new. It's like, no, it's not. Uh, you know, K-means clustering, that algorithm was like 1956. Yes. So SPSS and SAS have been around for 30, 40 plus years. So it's not as if this stuff is new. It's just, we now have so much more compute and storage in order to tackle these problems. So, so what else is so great? I mean, we, we talk about being a data scientist today uh, in working in a world of cloud. Absolutely. So there are two parts to this, this thought process. Um, first of all, being a data scientist itself, right? It is, I would say last five years, 10 years, like everybody can get access to content, resources, um, you know, books, material that they can actually go and educate themselves on this topic. I remember like back in, you know, in fact, back in 2012, when I was coming out of 
out of uh, data warehousing, getting into big data. And for me, like this fact that you can just predict the weather tomorrow, like that was, that's, I, I just could not understand like how that is happening. And mm -hmm. to be honest, it was very, very hard for me to then wrap my head around like, what is, what is it that we are using under the covers to make this happen? And now when somebody asks me like, hey, how do I get into data science field? I'm like, mate, you have a thousand resources. Like there are, yeah. you know, courses available. You mm -hmm. can educate yourself. They're, they're libraries. Like all you have to do is call a library, call a function, one single line of code, and yeah. you have built a model. I'm like, that is amazing. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I tell this story in 2014. I was working with an organization in the United States called SiriusXM, and they were attempting to develop a new algorithm uh, to predict what are the next three songs to listen to. And when you're talking about when you're talking about music, you have both rules, so you can't play the same artist so many times in the same hour, but you also want to be like, here are the people who want to listen to. This was going to be a significant amount of effort and intensity and money and lots of people uh, to actually put this up. Two and a half years later, three years, la three years later, I was sitting in a uh, meetup uh, where people had been taking Spotify uh, data and doing the exact same thing we were doing there. And it was like, yeah. you know, a couple of folks in a data science program. So I think that kind of talks to you, tells you a little bit about the speed at which things are moving and why it's so incredible. But I guess my question, because of your role uh, at Snowflake in the CTO office, you're attempting to discuss a lot of times and help people understand what this could be for their organization. So, yeah. and our, we talk about Eli Five, my CEO. So Eli Five, uh, the CEO that you're speaking to, especially you know customers that are typically looking at uh, Snowflake, they're lower end on their maturity. They're just getting it started in the cloud, and a lot of times, how do you explain why this is such a, an important segment right now? Sure. Um... Also, we did not cover the second part of the previous question, but oh, I, think I, I am sorry. <laughs> no, no, all good. But the answer for this and the other one actually are are kind of overlapping. Um, in cloud, all of us know, like there's practically unlimited storage and unlimited compute available, right? How do you make use of that? That is the biggest question today. Like infrastructure is not a problem. Nobody is going out there and saying, "Hey, I'm going to invest like." $25,000, I'm going to get this massive machine that has, you know, I don't know, 64 cores and, you know, I don't know, 20 terabytes of RAM in there, right? That is not what people are thinking about today. They are thinking about, hey, this server is available for a couple of dollars an hour and <laughs> I can use this server. The sad part of how most organizations are still going into cloud and running their data science workload is they're converting what they have on-prem into what's available in cloud. So yeah. they end up signing large contracts. They end up building these massive machines, ecosystems. So they've, instead of just to the point, instead of buying a server, now they're renting a server, but then they're acting in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And and they're lifting where, and shifting. They're not reimagining. No, no, absolutely not. And this is where I think Snowflake is coming in and it's actually talking to the customers. And there's a lot that we are doing here, right? So we have to, of course, have to have ways of running or supporting ML engineers, data scientists to natively run you know, their Python uh, code. They're accessing their open source libraries. But I think the bigger point here is how can we make sure that access to compute is monetized to a point where um, you know, they only pay for what they want to use for? They mm -hmm. get access to as much compute as possible, first of all, right? So if they want to run a training job on a terabyte of data, uh, which back in the days was not even imaginable, um, but today, you know, uh, you can do it. But what are, taking this example, right? What are organizations doing today? They are, they're beefing up a four terabyte machine. At the max, they can run like four projects in parallel because they have now paid for this massive infrastructure resources um, on the cloud itself. With Snowflake, what we are telling them is, hey, you want to do this, you want to train this, you only want to train this once a week or maybe once a day, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or you want to run continuous training. There are three patterns there. Um, only pay for a number of seconds you're going to go and train your model. And once the model is trained, just throw away that, that, that machine. Mm -hmm. You do not need that machine. You don't need to pay for that machine. And now mm -hmm. you're no longer constrained with 
with with the amount of resources and how quickly you can get access to those resources. So you I can, think that would be something, you know, in your conversations, I would say that is how does that resonate with a CIO uh, or a CTO or a chief analytics officer? Uh, because I think that would be an incredibly compelling argument for them, right? Absolutely. Uh, C-level execs, they, they, so if they know what they're doing in cloud, and this is not the first time they're having a conversation. <laughs> um, and the reason I bring, bring that point is because a lot of times when they are making the first move to cloud, they're very worried about the cost factor and everything, right? So mm -hmm. because I can access this massive machine with terabyte of RAM, you know, I might just spend too much money. And again, there are these safeguards and there are things that Snowflake has built, and it is actually recognized that as a problem, right? We always had those safeguards. We have now actually improved on them. Uh, we have yeah. put in place. Well, uh, I, can't, I think that's yeah. key for all all consumption-based tooling, whether Absolutely. we've seen in AWS or Azure, uh, GCP. Uh, nobody likes to, when we're moving from the ground to cloud, there was a fixed cost. I, yeah. I was in for that 50K on that server and I'm not going to spend any more. I'm, I'm going to have to pay for the power going yeah. into it and the people to upkeep, but I don't, it's not going to show up one day and have a quarter million dollar, uh, quarter million dollar bill associated yeah. with it because one, you know, one developer started up a hundred node cluster and left it on for a month. You know, true story. Yes. <laughs> by the way. I, I, I would, I have seen worse as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I've had a scenario where, you know, without naming the customer, uh, they, of course, uh, they actually had a 128 node cluster. Somebody physically, manually went there and said, do not shut down automatically because those are the things that are built in Snowflake. You would shut down a cluster if nobody's using it. He manually went there, unchecked that, left it running over the weekend, and it was not a good conversation after that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Look, that's I, the benefit, I, though. You could actually do that. Like, that's the key for me in, you know, when we talk about reimagining and really the compare and contrast for what we have seen previously, right? Yes. Uh, that wasn't uh, even four years ago, five years ago, you couldn't get to that kind of scale, right? Uh -huh. So to me that when we talked about comparing and contrasting kind of why it's so great to be a, a data scientist or really anyone in the cloud at this point is that ability to have that at your fingertips. Yeah. I, I so what do you, I mean, what are your thoughts there? And what are your thoughts actually, everybody? Uh, love to see your comments here on the LinkedIn. Follow us, of course, on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere else where you're getting your podcast. But please join the conversation. I'd love to hear, uh, if anything, just we love stories around here at the Proof of Concept podcast as well. So. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, my two cents on the whole compute that we were talking about, like, again, data scientists themselves have actually now figured out that there is different kind of compute that they need. They need massive amount of compute for certain section of data science workload, typically training a model, you know, running some mm -hmm. kind of feature engineering that is very intensive, that requires mm -hmm. a lot of RAM in, uh, for that purposes. But then if you look at data processing and when you look at inferencing, all of that can actually benefit from massively parallel processing, MPP kind mm -hmm. of infrastructure under covers. So again, the fact that you can have a really large machine for a certain use case, and then a lot of tiny machines that can be used as a cluster to make your jobs run much faster. Right? And, and, and all of them fall under this data science umbrella. Um, mm -hmm. That is probably the beauty of, of, of being in cloud today. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think that's, when I think about just even uh, any sort of workload in any individual, uh, you know, when we're talking about even inside of data science, if we're talking about software development, you know, comparing those across, right? These are, Absolutely. this is all available. If you're writing, you know, Rust, you know, a Rust application to deploy into a Kubernetes cluster, that's not happening. You know, a couple of years ago, your ability to scale out is not just a benefit to the data scientist, uh, but it really has truly changed an entire paradigm in terms of how we work uh, in general. Uh, so to me, that's one of the most interesting things uh, going on about this. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, 
we typically like to say, you know, where's the value? So how can we make money, save money, or improve the customer experience? So I'm going to throw a couple of uh, at you. Uh, so when we talk about making money uh, and revenue as a data scientist in the cloud right now, you know, what do you see? How how are customers, you know, of Snowflake and you know, general data scientists, how are they going about using this scale and capability to effectively move their businesses uh, forward? Yep. Uh, again, great question, because I don't think it's a matter of why, but it's a matter of when for most organizations um, and how for most organizations to start leveraging data science and machine learning. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody knows that if they end up integrating machine learning and for that matter, AI applications, and they, as part of their business itself, they're going to make substantial gains in the revenue. So mm -hmm. that is something that everybody knows about. In fact, I have customers that are now thinking about moving to cloud. In fact, I speak to people that are still on-prem, but they're making their technology. They're still out there. They're still oh, yeah. out there. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the amazing part here is that they probably don't even have a data scientist today, but they're making their technology decisions based on the mm -hmm. fact that they're going to be doing data science when they move to yeah. cloud. So that is, yeah, that is very, very, that tells, that, that tells where the mindset is uh, from, from the customer perspective. But the money that gets made or how you monetize um, the data science uh, or machine learning for, uh, for an organization comes from actually looking within what um, organization- Inside of ourselves, is it with us all along? I mean, yeah, we're getting philosophical here, but I mean, that is true in that case as well. But I think for organizations, there was a very interesting conversation just a couple of days ago in, in our uh, Sydney summit. Um, one of the, um, you know, one of the customers now, they were asking, like, how do I, like, how do I make sure I understand data science? I understand, you know, using all these, um, you know, patterns and paradigms, like, I, it's all good. Like, how do I, um, you know, make make sure that this is benefiting my underlying revenue. And this is where I think it's a, it's a core problem. Like, unless you don't know what you are going to use data science for, right? Mm -hmm. This is the first step. Every organization needs to know, this is what we want to do. Um, this is, and again, there's no set outcome. And this is something that they need to be, uh, first of all, they need to be aware of, right? It's nothing, it's not like BI where you know that that is the dashboard I want to see. So make this mm -hmm. happen. It's mostly an hypothesis. Somebody thinks that, you know, this is probably gonna, if we can predict, or if we can somehow have our customers in a particular, um, you know, group or segment, then we can probably do our marketing better, which will probably have benefit in our, or, or in our revenue that we will generate, right? So there's a lot of ifs and buts and probably in that statement, but that is true. This is what data science really is when it starts as a project. And then they have to continuously, slowly start delivering on the benefits. So somebody needs to take a simple problem to not overcomplicate it, right? That's mm -hmm. something that I tell everyone, like take something that is very, very simple and take that and treat it as a project that you want to take it to production. Mm -hmm. Because unless it goes to production, there's no value out of it. Yeah. So the money well, at least some, not nearly as much value. <laughs> I'll say that. Definitely. True, true. But if, yeah, unless you can't run it every day, right? That is my thing. You can run it once in a while through your notebook that are, that are on your laptop, which is fine, you know, which may work for some organizations. Mm -hmm. But unless you can run it once in a while, you know, every day, in fact, on, 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 on a Is it part of your business? You know, that to me yeah. is always, I, you bring up a good point. And I, and I, when I'm talking to clients about this and they're early in their maturity journey, I always talk about uh, Stephen Covey's second habit of highly effective people, uh, which is begin with the end in mind. So yes. know what you're doing. Uh, you you brought up the concept and idea that, hey, not a lot of folks are down that road. We just actually put out an ID, at Dataiku, we put out an IDC info brief, and worked with them. This is the third time we've done so. And only 39% of organizations in APAC today have actually are actually using AI. Um, and those that are, are starting to pivot in much the same way you're talking about. They're getting the value out of it. Um, and that's what's bringing about these data scientists and the value that we they can bring because they're starting to look at more at the customer problems uh, yep. out there today. So personalization, optimization, uh, 
how do you improve that customer experience? Absolutely. And, and again, because I mean, Forrester has done a study back in 2020 and back in the days, only you know, two thirds of the organizations are actually not going beyond experimentation phase on data science. Mm -hmm. Less than 15% are actually running it on, on a daily basis as part of their business. Um, mm -hmm. They have to, everybody has to think with an end goal in mind. Like how do I do something like create a form factor, build a project or build a model, deploy it, run it on a daily basis, gain confidence, show the value and then do it again. Right? It has to be like a repetitive process that you're able to build early in life cycle. What you can't do is 10, let's build 10 cool models and then we'll worry about productionizing them. So that's- But I want to build 10 cool models. Yeah, I, that's, <laughs> where, that's where the two thirds of the projects are. They're all just yeah. building the models. The second aspect so, of it, and this is where mm -hmm. I want to also start talking about things that for the future, right? What's, what's going to happen? Well, before you do that, before okay. you start, because I don't want, I want to stop you right there before you get into the predictions uh, for, for the last segment. But one of the things we highlighted a little bit earlier, we all hear the horror stories. And, you know, this is the save money aspect. You know, yes. it, so what sort of governance are you seeing? What sort of processes, frameworks people are putting together to ensure that, hey, these sorts of things do not happen? Because in effect... A bad experience very early on in a journey uh, colors the rest of the journey itself. So what are sort of the, what are the rules, the frameworks, the best practices people are putting in to ensure that they don't hurt themselves? And we'd love to hear what you guys think about this. It's like, how do you, you know, any, any stories, horror stories, but how do you actually, you know, try to you know, stop that from happening. So please follow us on Facebook, uh, drop comments here in the LinkedIn and obviously anytime, anywhere, wherever you're getting podcasts. So what do you got, Rishu? What are you, what are you telling folks? Yeah, look, again, this would now, the conversation is becoming more specific because the answer is depends on what they are using. Um, again, we have three major cloud providers, Globally, I mean, most of the organizations across the globe are working with these three major cloud providers. There are specific organizations and depending on the product, like every good product would have some sort of safeguards built into, mm -hmm. into the product, right? Um, this is where it's very, very important to understand how they are, the money is spent on whichever technology they're using. Um, and again, this could be a completely different set of individuals and good organizations that I've seen. Um, again, without taking names, uh, one of the <laughs> organizations I've seen here in the Guilty Australia, will remain nameless. <laughs> yeah, look, again, I, I just don't want to uh, take names. Yeah, 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 no worries, no worries. Those guys are so good in predicting their spend. They do, so they do a lot of things. One thing they've done is they have, individuals because they're using certain products um, where it's not that easy to figure out or there are no built-in safeguards against spend they have they have individuals their their job is to actually understand how the money is getting spent because for example let's take aws aws as an example right um people think storage is cheap storage is absolutely cheap but having said that what type of storage people, they charge you for accessing, like not many people realize how that bill can actually add up really, really quickly. Um, there are obviously things built into the product that can predict, that can help you. It's important to understand, right? I think it goes back to the point where if you don't understand the cloud can, the problem with cloud is it makes everything accessible and it makes everything accessible so easy that mm -hmm. you can, very, if you do not have the right kind of, people watching, overlooking, understanding how these services are gonna cost them, it's very, very easy to lose track of it. Um, and this is where I really appreciate organizations product that bake this functionality into the product itself, right? Mm -hmm. So it should, be, it should be as easy as defining, you know, let's say uh, budgets across, you know, across your compute resources, or you, you would basically go and say, hey, I'm using all these compute resources for my, for my projects. I want to budget this project and I'm not going to spend more than, or, or notify me if I'm spending more than 50% of the, 
of the cost, right? It should go in that direction where it's self-managed and self um, kind of um, governed. <laughs> governed, but I think I think self-monitored. Um, <laughs> products needs to be built, keeping this in mind, because I think that's going to be the biggest, as you said, that's going to be the biggest nightmare when you know people mm -hmm. are going. Especially, it's it's not comfortable for organizations when they're coming to cloud but it can be very, very expensive once the organizations are in cloud mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. there has to be, this has to be built in. Yeah, I, I love, uh, great follow on Twitter if you ever uh, like to hear your snark is a guy by the name of Corey Quinn with the Duckbill Group. He has a couple of podcasts out there and he talks a lot about this, you know, transparency and costs. The cloud gives you that transparency, but it, you know, uh, depending upon what services inside of AWS uh, you use, you may have a little bit more transparency in others, but... Uh, the architecture itself and how you design your systems and applications ultimately is a factor of, you know, will drive the cost and, you know, your posture and surface area of what you're dealing with. So I think you know, that's great advice is, you know, use what you got. You know, don't, don't go into any of these technologies without the concept and idea of what's, you know, let's at least have the emergency break or a safeguard in place. So at least I know if I'm flying down the road, um, and I'm going 250 kilometers an hour in a 70. <laughs> yeah. You know, whoops. <laughs> it never ends well. <laughs> it never ends well. That's right. But this is so following into our last uh, discussion here, part of the, the proof of concept podcast, I'm going to ask you to put on your prediction cap, uh, put on your magician's cap and kind of what is the, and I'm going to give you a little prompt. I'd love to hear as well. Uh, number one, what do you think is going, you know, why will it continue to get better? What's new and exciting that will come down the pike for uh, the data scientists that will continue to move? Um, and also, since you're here and you're someone who's, uh, we have a number of listeners who are just getting into this uh, industry uh, and getting into data science, what would you suggest in terms of any particular resources or knowledge bases, certifications that you're looking that you see or could be incredibly helpful for folks. Absolutely. Uh, so let's first tackle the second problem or the second question. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody who's who's planning to get into data science space now, um, I would say like do not the two things like the two things that happen like they've now th there's a diverse problem that I had. There's so many resources available to them. There mm -hmm. are Coursera courses. There are UADME courses. Coursera, Udemy, YouTube videos. Oh, exactly, <laughs> YouTube. You search on YouTube, and it's very easy to get overwhelmed. So my suggestion to everybody that asks me this question is that you pick one. Like, you cannot go wrong. Like, it's one of those, <laughs> right? Pick one that has a structured way of telling you uh, or introducing you to data science, right? Mm -hmm. It could be certification is something that you would want to do to self-validate how my, how good you are, what is the gap that you still need to go and learn. Um, there are courses that actually take you through uh, and teach you at, based on the certification exams as well. So, you know, cloud providers have certifications, mm -hmm. you know, our, our organization, our organization has company included for both of us. <laughs> Yeah, look, I mean, all these organizations, I, I, I'm just trying to not be very specific yeah. around certain organizations. But all I'm saying is like most organizations now have certifications for this, this, this practice. But the point here is how do you get to a point where you're ready to take a certification exam? And my suggestion is like pick a course. Don't, don't, don't overthink this, right? Go to UADME, go to, um, you know, uh, Coursera, go, go to YouTube. Like if you think this is, a, this is the right course uh, for you, um, do the course, right? It would probably take you three to four weeks, maybe three to four months, depending upon how difficult or easy course you pick. Stick to it. Like, don't, do not, um, you know, get distracted. Um, do the course from the T. And once you have done that, right? First of all, you have to do it. Second, like, stop taking more courses. <laughs> <laughs> because this is one thing that everybody does. They're like, oh, we have done this course. I probably know what is, um, you know, what is uh, uh, regression, but you know, let me do this another course and I'm going to learn more about classification, which uh, the course would have taught, but they probably did not get a lot about it. The second thing that I always tell people is another great resource. Um, you know, you have to go and start looking at code. Like start mm. getting it. Mm. Like do not overthink stuff, you know, go to Kaggle. Um, Pick a data source, pick a problem. You want to learn more about um, classification? 
go to Kegel, just search for classification and you would find data sources, you would find notebooks, um, go and access those notebooks, open the notebook, download the notebook, like be, 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 you know, be, be one with the notebook, be, one. be the thief, right? I would say be the thief, right? Because you're learning right now. What you have to do is understand every single line of code. Like until you don't understand every single line of code in that notebook, do not pick the second one. And the more time you spend with the code, the more time, the more comfortable you get with reading the code, the more you will realize that they're all the same. <laughs> it's not too different. <laughs> and end of the day, the concepts would start getting more clear in your head. And again, the more you read this course, uh, th do these notebooks, you will figure out, ah, you know what? I kind of have this question. And once you have a question, then go and explore that one particular topic. Just don't go start hunting for things that you have no idea what it is. That's a great, um, <laughs> that's a great way to attribute it. So what's going to happen? You know, what do you see in your kind of view of, you know, what are we, what are we going to look at in two and three years and what's going to still be great about being a data scientist? Yes. Uh, that's so uh, in my opinion, I think data science itself would keep getting easier from the perspective of getting access to resources, getting access to more access to data. In fact, if you see the market is now, so data is core for anything that we have to do with data science. It's the starting point. What is happening in last few years is that getting access to first party was always easy, right? Mm -hmm. Getting access to your second party data, third party data is actually now becoming much, much easier. Uh, there are marketplaces out there that you can actually go in and, and uh, get, with a single click, get access to data. You can build your own marketplace with select group of individuals, customers, second party providers, mm -hmm. and you can start sharing data, right? So once you have eliminated that data barrier and you have access to compute resources and you have ways to, to use your favorite algorithm, uh, building a model and as I said, in the beginning, it's not about building the model. It's, uh, it's all about taking that model to production and running it on a daily basis. It keeps on getting easier and simpler. But I think the end game is not that. The end game is the benefit that businesses are going to get. And which is, again, going back to our initial discussion point around business benefits, is not building a model. Is not uh, There's a bit of benefit when you run it on a daily basis in a batch mode or you integrate an application for an online inference. The end of the day, your consumers, the business users, are the ones that do not, they still do not get that, that leverage of the model that you have built. They can't interact with those models. It's very, very hard for them to do that. So in my opinion, applications built on AI, so AI applications built on data is what is going to happen in the next two to three years, two, three years time. Like somehow, mm -hmm. like once you have built a model, how can you build an quick, easy AI application. Again, think about productionizing it first, how you can have an AI application that can run every day in the hands of a marketing analyst or a business user that can actually go and find out how, if I, if I, if I change my investments in different um, you know, channels, how my revenue is gonna be affected, right? The model that you've built can easily be used through an application. Um, and that is, I think, going to change the way um, we can democratize data science for business mm -hmm. audience. Because today there's a massive gap between business and data scientists. And the only, I think, only point where they meet together is the inferences that are written back into databases, <laughs> which are then accessed through a Tableau notebook. That are <laughs> so, in a meeting room where they're bickering back and forth at each other. One of the two. Yes. <laughs> so there's no interactivity that is happening between the business and data scientists. I think that barrier is still there and there's a, there's a need to take that barrier down. Um, and that is, I think that is the next big thing that's going to happen in this space. If I was to kind of put on my cap on this, uh, number one, the same, same deal. Uh, the barriers continue to fall. Uh, the library as someone is an R programmer by trade, uh, an SQL, I'm a weird guy, <laughs> just in general, <laughs> versus everybody else. Uh, but I see it a lot. I see a lot of what has an R is becoming much more pervasive as a culture uh, in the rest of the uh, data science community being, hey, let's wrap functions. Let's make things easier for people to go out and do what they need to do. Um, I also see a lot more of the specialization. 
Um, if we, yeah. I think if you went back five years ago, you would never even, the term data engineer or data engineering didn't even exist. Uh, hmm. The role did. Uh, it was part of a data science role, scientist role, or maybe you were an ETL developer or a DBA, but the function was there. Uh, I see it continuing to follow along in much the same way as I, I make this analogy back to webmasters at the beginning of the late nineties, beginning of aughts. Uh, the webmaster was responsible for the server, the administration of the server, the content, and uh, the development of the application itself. And guess what? Those all splintered um, into specialization roles. And we're going to continue to see that in the data scientists. The good news is, uh, the stuff that's really cool and very interesting to a lot of folks in data science in terms of building models, uh, we're going to continue to see that specialization go through ML engineering. Um, you see that much more often now than you did probably three to four years ago. So that specialization, I think, is going to be incredible for a lot of folks out there. Um, I do want to make one more point that you made a little bit earlier, and we've kind of talked about, you know, beginning with the end of the mind, beginning with the production in mind. So... Uh, earlier this week, uh, Greg Root, uh, the head of data platforms for Canva, uh, was a guest uh, right there at the Snowflake Summit here in Sydney. And that was one of his key takeaways. Like, you have to start, you know, with some concept of getting something into production. You must have a view of that uh, before yeah. you begin. And, you know, given Canva's, you know, how well they're done, yeah, not a bad idea. <laughs> Not a bad way to kind of address the problem, right? <laughs> I, I loved his point of view where he was saying that treat this as an engineering problem, right? So you do not, like, whenever you're doing data science, like, it has to be an engineering problem. There has to be CI, CD built into your thought process while you're actually going and thinking about building a model. Think about productionization of that model, like, before even you go and start playing with the tools and, and, and you know, technologies. Um, like uh, again, as you said, like Canva is if if Greg is saying that, and if they have forty models in productionization and um, production, like I, like he knows what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the benefit of uh, the last kind of what I think is great about being a data scientist right now, especially in the cloud, is you get to understand and learn from all of these individuals and organizations that have been scaling up, like uh, Canva here in Australia. Just a, an incredible story. Uh, for the country itself. Uh, but standing on the backs of giants is not a bad place to be in a lot of ways uh, because now you you can actually, you don't have to start brand new. Uh, a lot of folks have retread that have gone down that road and we'd love to hear how you've gone down that road or how you might even be starting to go down that road. Maybe you're as an organization just haven't, uh, maybe you're listening now and you're like, hey, maybe, you know, should we be thinking about this AI stuff? Love to hear your comments. Love to hear your feedback. Uh, Rishu, it has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, as always, my friend, it seems like we always have a good time when we start chatting with each other. So we end up going a little bit longer than we should, but it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us here at the Proof of Kind pod podcast. Take care. Thanks so much and have a great day.